It's time for Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Join us as we study the uncompromised Word of God and how it can be applied to our everyday lives. He's going to be talking to us about our hearts this morning. And as we've studied holiness and repentance and the stages of growth, those of you who come on Wednesday nights for a Bible study, um, I've learned so much. I've, I've learned so much that I don't know very much. You know what I mean? I've got a long ways to go, but it's so sweet how he brings us up and grows us up. But one thing through these studies of, of holiness and repentance, by the way, those are not ugly words. Those are beautiful words when they're studied correctly. Repentance and holiness, those are beautiful things. In the eyes of fact, it's called the beauty of holiness. So it's beautiful to him. But there's one thing I want to want to make sure that we get clear. Because the church universal has really missed the point about us being holy and about us having a heart of repentance. And that is that our ability to change and, and our ability to be formed and our ability to be, to be molded, as we've been talking about on Wednesday nights, into the image of Jesus Christ, as we should be, it shouldn't come from outside pressure. It should come from an inward desire. And what religion has tended to do is give an outside pressure to be perfected. Instead of it being an inward desire for us to want to be perfected and for us to have such a relationship with a loving God. And herein lies the trouble. Christians haven't known that they're serving a loving God. Oh, they say it. God is love. And then they'll turn around and the next statement say, you never know what God's going to do. No, he's, he's love. I know what he's going to do. And so we've sent out, I'm not even going to say we, because I was, I was brought up, thank God, I was brought up to know that God is a loving God. He is, better than that, a loving Father. Father. And that anything that comes from him, the scripture's very plain, it is light. There is no darkness in him. There's, n there's not even a shadow of turning. There's no gray in him. He is good and he is love. And so when we say, let's be molded, let's be shaped in the image of God, the only way you're going to be molded and shaped is when you trust whose hands you're putting yourself into. And see, this is the problem, and this is not in the notes, but the problem with people is if their heart is not right, and God is present. You would see this with Pharaoh. I'll never forget Dad's explanation of that scripture where it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Because that sounds horrible. It sounds like Pharaoh didn't have a choice, and I don't like that because we know God gave mankind choice. But it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the way Dad always explained that to me was that God is like the sun. And you can, you can shine the, the heat of the sun, the warmth of the sun on a piece of wax. And what does it do? It melts. It softens. It becomes pliable. But you can put that same warmth on a piece of clay. And you know what it does? It hardens. What changed? What was the difference? Was it the warmth of the sun or was it the condition of what the warmth of the sun was upon? It is the heart of man. And you'll see that with Jesus when he's dealing with people. Here we have the woman caught in adultery whom you would think he should be hard on. But it melts her. But we have the Pharisees whom it hardens. What's the difference? Jesus? No. No. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The difference is the condition of the heart. And so he's bringing us to a place where he can use us as the body of Christ. He needs us and he wants us to function in this earth as his son did. And if we're going to do the works of Christ, which the scripture is very plain, that we're to be doing the works of Christ, then we must be moldable. We must be shapeable, we must be changeable into the image of Christ, as we talked about the last Wednesday night that I was here. 
And that's done by love. But what are you going to do with what he's, the warmth of him? Are you going to harden and say, "Mm mm-mm, can't use me. You don't know what I've done. Oh, nope, can't use me. I'm not that type. That's not my personality. I'm shy. I'm backwards. Well, so was I. But fortunately, I was raised in a home that kept the warmth of God on me. And at times, whooped me if necessary. Not very often. I was kind of daddy's girl, so I didn't get it like David got it. Made sure, above all else, that I was moldable in the hands of God. Parents, that's your job. So that he could take a shy girl who would not speak to anyone and use her. Now, if he can use me, far from perfect, but willing. He wants to use you. And it may not be behind a new nice podium that you observed this morning. It may not be behind a podium, but he has a place for you in the body. Everybody has a place in the body. But we've got to condition our hearts to where we can be molded. How many of you are doing things you thought you would never do? Oh, John Glenn, raise your hand. I went to school with you. It's my cousin. Once you become moldable, once you let down that stone wall that you've built up because you've been hurt, been hurt, been disappointed, been hurt, and you realize you can trust God with you, it's beautiful to watch people being molded and shaped as we've got to watch some of you. And as some of you older ones in the room <clears throat> have got to watch me. Some of you have known me since I was a little girl. And so you watch that process in people's lives, and there's just nothing more beautiful to God. Just remember that to be changed, to be formed, don't let it come from outside pressure. You need to look this way. This is what holiness looks like. No, holiness is a desire for God. And that changes you. That's why people fail, fail, fail on the outside. They're doing it with the wrong motivation. And it's got to come from an inward desire because you love God, because he's good to you. We've got to get that message out. God is good, and he is love. Jesus is all about the heart. I mean, when when you read the Old Testament, it's all about the exterior things. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Don't do this or this happens. If you do this, this happens. It's the Old Testament, it's the law. It showed us we needed a Savior. We could not live up to the standard of the Old Testament, but Jesus could. Now under the new covenant, it says a better covenant, which is under grace through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, everything changes, and it's not just about the exterior actions anymore. Jesus goes deeper. Now it's not just don't do it, it's don't you think it. Now it's don't just murder your brother, it's don't hate him in your heart. And so it goes so much deeper, and and I love Jesus for that, because he doesn't just deal with the exterior issues. He and the Holy Spirit go on the inside and, and start making changes. So in the weeks to come, as we talk about change, as we talk about growth, and as we go deeper into really purifying our lives. Don't let that be a scary subject to you. It's a beautiful subject, and it's so that he has vessels of honor that he can use. Whether that's on your job, whether that's uh, through music, whether that's uh, in your home as mothers and fathers, as mates, um, he needs us, and he needs us to be in right heart. So as we do that, I want us to be careful to keep a couple of things in mind, these things in mind about the heart so that we don't fall into the trap of religion again. We don't want to fall into the trap of religion, of looking at the exterior, but we want to, as we study these things, look at the inside and remember that we're walking in the grace of relationship. As everything we do needs to come because of the awareness of relationship. And uh, Tanya and I have been listening to a guy and he's been teaching on the Holy Spirit and, and I love this example. He said, what if, um, y'all don't have like just a simple piece of cloth. Yeah, we do. 
He used the example of a dove. And he was talking about when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the bodily shape of a dove. And he said, you know, if I had a dove up here and I placed it upon my shoulder and I would become so aware, so aware of its presence that every move I make would be made in awareness of his presence because I don't want it to go away. Oh man, is that life altering? We have the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit living on the inside of us and he wants us to become so aware of his presence that every move we make is in awareness of him. That's holiness. That's purity. It's beautiful. You know, the scripture often uses the word perfect. And I don't know about anybody else in this room, but you start mentioning the word perfect when God says to be perfect as he is perfect. That word can be a whole lot intimidating. Because we throw it around, I want to be the perfect wife. I want to be the perfect mother. You want to be the perfect employee. You want to be the perfect player on the team. You want to be perfect. And as we read scriptures, we read into those scriptures when we see the word perfect, our definition of perfection, which is man-pleasing. That's what it is. Perfection to us is what looks right to everybody else. That is far from perfect definition. It does not, does not match God's definition. Go with me to Genesis chapter 6. And let's look at the first example that we had of God calling somebody perfect. We titled today's message, The Perfect Walk. That's what we're after. Genesis chapter 6, I'm going to pick up in verse 5. It says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So here he's seeing the heart of man, his thoughts, the thoughts of his heart, and that they were evil. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I'll destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made him. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Now, first of all, know what God was doing here. A little side lesson. God in Genesis had promised. He had set out a promise. He had made a threat on the devil. He said, there's one coming who's going to bruise your head. You'll bruise his heel. And he made the promise of Jesus coming. All through scripture, when you see God preserving his people, he's preserving that seed has to. If Noah would have stayed in the earth and his seed would have been destroyed by evil, then the promise could not have been fulfilled. That promise has been fulfilled, therefore God never again has to flood the earth. We see the rainbow to assure us of that because the promise has arrived and he doesn't have to protect that seed anymore. But that's what he was doing here. But what I want us to concentrate on today is that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Then he gives Noah the instructions for the ark, which we're not going to read lest we get caught up in all of that. In verse 22 it says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Now there's some keys in this passage for today's message. The word used here in verse 9, Noah was a just man and perfect. Really, we can read that passage and we can get the definition of God 
perfection. What God considers perfection. I think we all know that Noah was not a perfect man. Anybody remember the first thing Noah did when he got off the boat? Got drunk, passed out. Okay, so I think we can kind of figure out Noah had his days. So we know perfection it doesn't mean perfection in action. We can mark that one off. And we'll get down to some more meaning. But Noah walked with God. I think that's a key here. Noah walked with God and did what God asked of him. He was obedient. See, obedience followed the walk. He walked with God and thus he did what God had commanded. The obedience follows the walk. The walk doesn't follow the obedience. And this is what Christianity has tried to put on people. Be obedient so you'll have a relationship with God. No. Build a relationship with God and you will walk in obedience. The relationship must come first. We've got to concentrate on the relationship before we move into the actions. It is the core, it is the center, it is the hub from which everything else flows out of. Even healing the sick, getting people born again, prosperity, it doesn't matter. Everything in the scripture comes out of the hub of your relationship with the Father God. And so I think that that's very key here that Noah walked with God and did what God asked of him. This obedience came from the relationship. He walked with God. The Amplified says he habitually fellowshiped with God. Therefore, he found grace in the eyes of God. So this word perfect that God used to describe Noah does not describe Noah's actions. It describes his relationship. It's a much better Definition than perfection in my actions. If the perfect walk is what I'm after, it's going to be about my heart rather than my actions. His heart towards God was sincere. He was one of integrity. And because of that heart, God would work with him. God would work with him and Noah would allow God to work with him even in his imperfect moments and his imperfect actions because his heart was right, it was sincere, it was one of integrity. Then the two could work together. God wants to work with me. That's just a pretty incredible statement. You, you'll have to say that for yourself. God wants to work with you. God, creator of the universe, you know the one I'm talking about, wants to work with you. And all he needs is a willing heart, a sincere heart out of integrity who wants to be worked with. Go with me to Genesis 17. This is the second mention of the word perfect. And when I went to it, I was just going through these on my computer program. I was really pleasantly surprised at what I found. The Holy Spirit's pretty amazing. When he'd given me the title, I had no idea what he was gonna, where he was going to take me from from there. But I always find him fascinating. Genesis 17, starting on verse 1. It says, When Abram was 99 years and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Those words kind of sound familiar to me. Walk in perfection. We just read them talking about Noah. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him. Isn't it interesting that here again we see the words perfect and walk paired together? The perfection came with the walking. Both times. And then God spoke, and then man's actions followed. Because of the relationship, God could ask him to do something and know that man would do it. But the walking came first. We're trying to do the doing and, and have it result in the walking. And it just doesn't work that way. We walk with God. And when we walk with God, he can talk to us. And when that conversation begins and that relationship is established, obedience is not an issue anymore. It's just not. 
It, it comes out of that relationship. A word from God and a word from man are totally different. Because some of you sitting out there today are looking up here and you're going, well, Susan did a good job, Susan did a bad job, Susan said this, Susan said that. But some of you here are saying, God said, oh, the Father said to me today. Because you have a relationship, what you're hearing is not from a woman, it's not from a man, it's from God. And it will change how you do church. Because you're not just coming to see how she pulls off something today. What she's going to talk about today. What's going to happen today. It becomes about a part of the conversation that is ongoing. Doesn't just start when you walk in this building. But it is a continual, habitual conversation between you and your father. Then everywhere you go, you're hearing God. You're pulling, you're pulling what God is saying. Jesus did this when he was walking through a cornfield. He's walking through a cornfield. He sees a tree. Suddenly everywhere, even nature itself, is God speaking to him. It's the Father speaking. It's the, it's the Father showing him something. You want life to change? Start looking for the Father. Then everywhere you go, it's the awareness. It's that awareness of something being with you because you've kept it ongoing and you've kept it habitual. And then it changes everything. Samuel the prophet is sent by God to anoint the one who would become king. Because uh, Saul's heart was right before God and then he got distracted and his heart turned from God, he was going to be replaced. And so God sent Samuel the prophet to find the one, to anoint the one who would become king. And all of Jesse's sons, he tells him it's going to be one of the sons of Jesse, are to pass before the prophet at this dinner. And I love this in 1 Samuel 16, 7. You can read the whole passage at some point because it's, it's, it's a beautiful passage on how God works. But it said, the Lord, in verse 7, But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on, he looks on the heart. And so all these other brothers are brought before the prophet, and, it, and the prophet's not feeling it. I mean, no, the spirit's saying, no, it's not him, it's not him, it's not him. Why did God use you? Why would God want to use you? It all comes down to heart. Why is God not using you? It all comes down to heart. So all of these brothers pass by and the prophet says, hey, is this all the boys? Because I'm not feeling it here. Jesse said, well, there's that, that one. <laughs> there's that one I've got out feeding the sheep. We'll bring him here. And David walks in. Mm. And it comes all over the prophet. And he said this. This is he, because he looked on the heart and not on the outward appearance or the outward ability. And so David was chosen by his heart. That very heart that we read about in the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 51 and verse 10, that cried out to God and said, Create in me a clean heart, God, and renew a right spirit within me. Perfection by earth standards far from it. Read his story. Far from it. But his heart's cry was, create in me a heart. And when you look this up, man, I looked it up in some of the commentaries. I just didn't know if I'd have time to cover it. Create. It's the same word, create, that's used in Genesis. And it's like daily we can cry out for a, a, this new atmosphere for God to work with. Create in me, 
Create in me a new heart and renew a right spirit within me. That was the heart God was looking for to lead the nation of Israel. And, and it's, it's beautiful. And he remained in the eyes of God. Even mistake after mistake. I mean, Bathsheba, for instance. Um, accomplice to murder, for instance. Sin after sin, mistake after mistake. And then God made this astounding statement about David in Acts 13. I'm going to start reading verse 22. It says, And when he had removed him, Saul, from being king, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. And he said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Hmm. It's from that heart. It is from that seed that Jesus came. The one who knelt in the garden and said, Not my will, but yours be done. That's where it came from. That's where it came from. Jesus was a man, but this was his lineage. Acts 13 is beautiful to me. Because it's not about a perfection that is man's standard. It is about a heart that wants to know God's heart. That can trust him that the work that he would do in us would be a beautiful work. He's not out to put us through pain. He's not out to put us through misery. He's not out to break us. As I hear ministers say, he is out to build us. He is out to mold us. He is out to make us into the image of Christ. And I hear people say this all the time. Well, God won't give me more than I can take. Well, tell that to the mama who buried his son who killed himself. And you say stupid statements like that. People around you die on the inside. They die to God because you just made a statement for God that is a lie and it is not the truth. God doesn't put stuff on you to see how much you can take. That's ridiculous. And then there's the statement of, well, they didn't die because God must have had a plan for them. We'll say that to the mama who's buried her son. And if I didn't know God better than I know you, you would destroy me. But I know John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that they might have life and have life more abundantly. So we can't let these religious cliches come out our mouth. In case you can't tell, they infuriate me. Because they separate people from a loving, building, restoring, reviving, creating God. He's not out to destroy you. He's not out to test you. He knows you. He knows your heart better than you know your heart. That's why he's dealing with us today. He wants us to cry out, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a heart that never existed before. One without the junk one without the fear, one without the hurts, creating me a heart that is willing to free fall. You say jump, I jump. You say pray, I pray. You say give, I give. That takes a created heart, not one that has come to, by what's happened to us in life and has been built by experience. That comes from loving God and knowing that he loves you. So David came from a heart that Jesus, I mean, Jesus came from a heart like David had. And Jesus truly walked with God as, as man had never done before. Not only perfect in heart, but perfect in action. The perfect walk. But it came the same way that the others came. It came through relationship. He had a relationship with the Father. And when you go through and you just read the words in red, and you watch his relationship with the Father, 
it's really an interesting study to see that relationship between the two of them. And then you can see how he walked perfectly. I love what Josh Barnett brought out on the teaching on holiness. I believe it was him. I've listened to several people. But um, he said, you know, Adam and Eve walked. They had this perfect walk with God. They, they walked with God in the cool of the day. And I like to try to imagine that. They walked with God in the cool of the day. Nothing wrong between them. Just pure, perfect. Until, basically, they decided to take a day off. They, de they decided to take a day off. Just one day, they weren't there when he showed up to walk with them. And they walked with another. And when they walked with another, they talked with another. And they obeyed another. It's just that simple. We must habitually walk with God. It is the key to our success as Christians. Habitual communication and closeness with God. They failed because they walked and talked with another and decided to take a day off. I, oh, mm, this is not in your notes, so write this one down, Genesis 5.22. I got to reading about Enoch. He's not on your flannel graph boards. More than likely, those of us who are old enough for flannel graph boards in Sunday school, you know, we had Noah, we had David. Not very often did you talk about Enoch. But Genesis 5.22 says this, oh, this is an amazing scripture. It says, Enoch walked with God. And you can look in other versions and it says, he habitually walked with him in closeness, in constant touch with him. He spent his life in fellowship with God daily. And then it says, Enoch walked with God and was not. Now, I've gotten kind of close to this sometimes, and it's, it's, it's kind of an amazing experience. When you are so in communion with God that you are not. Enoch walked with God habitually in closeness, in constant touch with him. He spent his life in fellowship with him, and Enoch was not. He was no more. Then one day, he was simply gone. He had walked away with God. Whew. Now, you just think on that. Now, I'm not looking to disappear up here in front of y'all today. Okay? I got, I got a, a husband who needs me. A daughter who needs me. My babies that need me. I've got a son-in-law who really needs me. So I'm not planning on disappearing. Thank you, Lisa. I was waiting, was pulling for it, nothing was happening. But metaphorically, it's a beautiful picture when we walk so close to God that we're not. Even in praise and worship, when studying that, I, I, I love some of the, the great praise and worship leaders, and I think our, our team is on track. Oh, man, they're on track. We've even had some reports of some supernatural things being heard uh, the last couple of weeks, and it's not my story to tell necessarily, but um, there's been more than one account on the same day of voices being heard that were not mouths moving. So you're on track. Keep going. <laughs> Keep going. But for us to not exist, even as a worship team, for it not to be a people looking at us and us performing and us doing a good job behind the pulpit, for us for it to be the, the voice of God and the, the words of God and for it not to be, oh, I did a good job or did I not... For us to walk so closely with God that we disappear, that we are not. I was crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. That's where the body of Christ is headed. John 17. While you're turning there, I'll give you Matthew 5, 8. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. 
Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Who? Because I want to see you. I want to see you. What a wonderful promise. Blessed are the pure in heart. I hope you get a whole new definition of pure and of perfection today. That it's about your heart's cry and not about your actions. Actions will follow. They'll follow your heart. Instead of us going after the actions being perfect, let's go after the attitude of the heart. John 17, this is so powerful, and I planned on reading it all. Let's just do it. Jesus is getting ready to leave the earth, and he prays for you. He prays for Josiah. He prays, he prays for you in this passage. And if you don't take it personal, then this is just a great read. But he is praying for you here. I believe he had faith. So I believe my life needs to conform to it. He says, Father, the hour is, the hour is come glorify your son, that your son may also glorify you. As you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. That's us. And this is the life eternal, that they might know you. He's talking about you. This is who he's praying for. Those who would receive eternal life, and this is what eternal life is, folks, that we would know God, the one only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men that you have given me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever you had asked, you had given me, are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are yours. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine. That's the unity of this relationship. What, uh, April, what's yours is mine, and what's mine is yours. She taught that beautifully last Sunday night if you missed it. This is what he's saying here, this is covenant talk. And now I am no more in the world, for these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost except for Judas, the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee. And these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that you should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is the truth. Sanctify them, purify them, cleanse them, set them apart by your word. And thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. And, and where in that does he say through their circumstances? He doesn't. It's, it's always through the truth. We'll, we'll talk about that again on another session. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them which shall believe on me through their word. That's me. That's me. I'm in that verse right there. Jesus said, I'm not just praying for these disciples standing right here. I am praying for those who will receive me through their word. Jesus just said, Susan, I am praying for you. All of this is about you. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me 
and I am in you, that they also may be... Can you even spit that out? That you may be one with God and Jesus. Now that is a close relationship, symbolized only through the marriage of man and woman. The only thing that can even compare to it. That they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. So apparently something's going to happen when we become one with them in relationship. Something that the world can see that will make them believe where they did not believe before. As a whole, the church has not given them that. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. What? The glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me father I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world O righteous father the world has not known thee but I have known thee and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them your name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, it just doesn't get any better than that. This is how you're made perfect. When you are in one relationship with them, that's the perfect walk. Amen? What a sweet presence is in this place. Y'all can stand. You know, it's so nice to be able to stand up here and say, your sins are forgiven. You know, this is the truth. Your sin is forgiven. And for that to be the message of the church, instead of your sin is, and making a list of one through ten, to be so one with the Father that you can walk in the forgiveness of sins, the healing of the sick, loving the unlovely. That's where we're, that is where we're headed. I know where he's taking us. Without the shadow of a doubt, he is taking us to a place where we disappear and he lives through us. And it all starts with relationship. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. If you would like more teaching, you can visit our website at www.rccenter.org or download our app to your device. The Russellville Christian Center is located at 305 Lakefront Drive. If you would like to purchase a copy of this program, or if you would like more information, please call 479-968-7965.